Dr. Avis Glaze is known as an international leader in the field of education. As one of Canada's outstanding educators, she has been recognized for her work in leadership development, student achievement, school and system improvement, character development, and equity of outcomes for all students. As Ontario's first Chief Students Achievement Officer and founding CEO of the Literacy and Numeracy Secretariat, she played a pivotal role in improving student achievement in Ontario schools. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Avis Glaze. Thank you very much for that introduction and to Shelley, Kate, Gala, and all the members of the BC Principals and Vice Principals Association. It's certainly a pleasure to be here. As you know, I've just recently moved from Ontario. I'm now living in Tawasson and uh, I love your, your province very, very much. Uh, I chose as a topic of my presentation the whole issue of excellence with equity the public education imperative. And there is a handout for you, I'm sure it, it has been passed around. I've been thinking about that topic quite a lot recently, especially after having read uh, some 16 trends by Gary Marks. I love the futurist literature and uh, I follow the trends research. And um, I'm just going to read uh, two of those tr trends which I think are very important for us of the 16. One is that ma majorities will become minorities, creating ongoing challenges for social cohesion. Another trend, social and intellectual capital will become economic drivers, intensifying competition for well-educated people. And, and, and the, the, the other one which is important, as nations vie for understanding and respect, in an interdependent world, international learning, including diplomatic skills, will become basic, and it goes on and on and on. But when I speak to groups, I very often ask them about these trends, especially the one about majorities becoming minorities. And I don't think many people have fully thought about that particular trend. Uh, recently, maybe about a month ago in the Globe and Mail, there was an article that with that heading, majorities becoming minorities. And in that light, I thought in, in, in discussion uh, with Gail and others that the topic could very well be excellence with equity, the public education imperative. Recently, there have been a number of books that have tried to address that question. You may have seen the one by Wilkinson and Pickett and they talked about unequal societies, why more equal societies do better. They talk about the myriad problems, the social and environmental problems that will affect our lives if, if indeed our societies be, continue to be unequal. They also state that societal inequity affects all of us, the wealthy as well as the poor. One of the things I used to say to the principals in Ontario when I was in, in charge of the improvement strategy is that there was nothing more important to me than thinking of my old age. And I would start with, when I'm an old woman, will I be able to walk the streets without looking over my shoulder, without holding on to my purse? And now that I'm in British Columbia, I'm thinking the same thing in my little town of Tawasson. What will it be like if we do not educate all children successfully. I use the term excellence, and as, as Einstein said, excellence is never an accident. It's always a result of focused intention, sincere effort, and intelligent, skillful execution. It represents wide choices, or wise choices, among many alternatives. When I think of the topic of excellence and equity, I think of the many imperatives that there are why this should be important to us. The moral imperative, we know that very well as educators. We all go into teaching because we want to change the world, we want the best for children, and so on, regardless of background. 
But after a time, I, I started saying less about the moral imperative. I assumed that people got that one. Others started talking about, well, why should we focus on excellence and equity? To my mind, the economic imperative is also important. A few years ago, Stats Canada said, a mere one percentage gain in literacy brings back $18.5 billion to the economy. So they were quantifying literacy and what it means. There are other imperatives, the value for money, the demographic imperatives. As more and more people come to Canada to find a home, they want their children to be educated. And immigrants very often want their children to be more educated than they are. There is a social justice imperative, the community health imperative, and most importantly, the human rights imperative. As we know, there is a global focus on high achievement. I travel the world extensively, speaking in different countries. And wherever I go, it's the same cacophony of voices talking about the need for improvement in achievement. Recently, as you know, Andreas Schleicher from, from OECD said that the, the capacity of countries, both the world's most advanced economies, as well as those experiencing rapid development, to compete in the global knowledge economy increasingly depends on whether they can meet a fast-growing demand for high-level skills. This, in turn, hinges on significant improvements in the quality of schooling outcomes and a more equitable distribution of learning outcomes. It means then that we need to harness the energy of all children. We can not only uh, accept the fact that within the literature we see a preponderance of findings that link educational outcomes to socioeconomic status. When we worked in Ontario, and uh, I was at the Secretariat, one of the things that we set out to do is to narrow the achievement gaps. Because we can no longer have, when we disaggregate the data, looking at who are the children who are not improving. And uh, let's say in the Toronto area, for example, there were the children from the Caribbean, there were the children from Spanish-speaking backgrounds, uh, the Portuguese-speaking students, and uh, many of our Aboriginal students. They were clustered at the bottom. To my mind, the true measure of excellence is how students achieve in school. We cannot say we're an excellent school system if there's a long tail of failure. And even more importantly, if when we disaggregate the data, we can see distinct groups. Recently, one of my concerns is for boys. Because across the world, I see a trend where boys are being left behind. In the 70s, after the women's movement, you can well imagine that I was one of those really carrying the banner for the education of young women. But because I'm a human rights advocate, I really believe that I cannot be selective about the human beings for whom I will advocate. And that has changed over the years. These days, it's around the education of young men because I see that change. It's a challenge to educators, therefore. Many people compare us to the business world. And I know educators do not like to have that comparison. But I think if we want to demonstrate that we uh, believe in accountability, sometimes there are lessons from business that we can learn in education as well. Uh, Whittle challenges us. He says, in schools of the future, leaders will assume highly consistent academic results. And this is what some of my educational colleagues may not like, this comparison. The same way flight crews assume flawless performance. The same way doctors and patients now expect near perfection in certain basic procedures. In hospitals and airplanes, lives are on the line. In schools, the quality of those lives is determined. The standards should be the same. We could debate that. 
I, I, I bring about these comparisons to be provocative because I think that's the level of accountability we should be aiming at in education. Whitlaw also says, schools of the future will have an embedded culture of outrage, a genetic commitment to accountability, and a, and a mentality that requires, with rare exception, that all children should achieve significant levels of proficiency in reading, math, and other basic skills. There must be a built-in view that it is not acceptable for children to fail. It's going to be very hard to get delve deeply into this topic uh, in the few minutes that I've been given, and I really want to be conscious of time. But we could talk about things like the equitable school and what those characteristics look like. The fact that there must be a laser-like focus on achievement and what it means. The fact that with our growing diversity, we must make sure that within that diversity, we see achievement so that we can no longer predict children's educational outcomes by postal codes. So the, the, the mandate for us as educators today, the challenge for us is to close the achievement gaps. That's one of the things we focused on in Ontario before I left there. Sorry to speak about Ontario here, but um, that's the last job I had as a Chief Student Achievement Officer. Uh, the focus was on achi uh, closing achievement gaps. When I took on my job, 19% of our schools were low performing. After four years when I left, that had been reduced to 5% of the schools that were low performing. And this was because of the focused intervention strategy that we developed for those schools that were not achieving to the extent that uh, we thought they should. Now at the secondary level, we have 93,000 more graduates because of the focus on high graduation rates. What are some of the lessons learned in Ontario? We had to instill a sense of urgency around improving student achievement. We said that if we want to be excellent, we had to demonstrate equity. We developed a character development program. As you know, that helps to address issues of school culture so that teachers could spend more time on teaching and less time on, 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 on disciplining students. We use data to drive decisions. We established a very small number of precise goals. In fact, at the elementary level where we started with this uh, initiative, we completely revised school plans. When we started off, I asked to see 4,000 school plans, just to look at them, and they were like compendiums. We helped principals to sharpen and reduce these to two or three pages at the most so that they were focused with very precise goals. Setting high expectations for all, focusing on strengthening literacy and numeracy skills, helping people to focus on the research-informed, high-impact strategies. There was an investment in people, providing necessary resources, creating a more collaborative culture, uh, focusing on student interests and backgrounds and student engagement initiatives providing ongoing interventions for the students who are not doing well, engaging parents and so on in their children's education. Let me wind this up uh, by saying, we also, within the Ministry of Education, when we started, and Ben Levin was uh, in the ministry at the time, there were about 13 goals of education. We reduced those to three high levels of achievement, reduce gaps in student achievement, and increasing public confidence in the public education system. And the reduction of those goals really helped us to focus our strategy quite a bit. We also developed an equity and inclusive education strategy, um, addressing all the areas identified in the Human Rights Code. And that really helped us to indeed uh, 
uh, improve achievement. All schools had to focus on non-negotiables in terms of the few strategies that were research informed that would improve achievement, having common assessments. Uh, the strong focus on feedback, and you have seen this time and time again in educational literature, how important feedback is. Specific strategies like cooperative learning, using manipulatives and so on, inquiry-based teaching and learning, that laser-like focus on achievement, clear curriculum choices, frequent assessment of progress, an emphasis on nonfiction writing. We know that from the work of Reeves that nonfiction writing helps to improve um, all areas of the curriculum and the whole area of collaborative scoring of student work. I could go on and on, but I want to respect the time constraints. Let me say that I would like to end, rather, with Ron Edmonds. In 1979, Ron Edmonds was known as the patriarch of the effective schools movement. This is what he said. We can, whenever and wherever we choose, educate all children whose schooling is of interest to us. We already know more than we need to know to do that. But whether we do so or not will ultimately depend upon how we feel about the fact that we haven't done so thus far. Can you imagine in 1979, he said, we already know more than we need to know to educate all children whose schooling is of interest to us. I really believe we have the will and the skill to close achievement gaps. Thank you very much.